surprise, it's me, Bishop Kristen. I know that today is supposed to be a Color Amazed Preaching Sunday, and I am literally right now just looking at myself in the screen about as white as one can get. Why is that, you might be wondering? Well, we did have and do have a Color Amazed sermon provided for today. Francisco Herrera, a PhD student out of our seminary in Chicago, has prepared and provided an incredibly powerful, challenging sermon. As we listened to the sermon, it became obvious that while it is an important word for us to hear as a synod, we are not necessarily in a place right now where hearing that word is possible. We know that part of the work of preaching is to afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted, but the reality is, is that that's sometimes a very fine line to walk. And sometimes that line is virtually impossible to walk if you are not a member of the community to which you preach. So I made the decision that I would provide a secondary sermon and that both sermons would be provided to congregational leaders to be used as they saw fit this morning. If you are watching me preach to you right now, it is because your pastor or your deacon decided that perhaps Francisco's sermon was a little stiff stiffer than what we could handle today. My providing this sermon should not be interpreted in any way, a comment against the sermon or against Francisco. I found it to be terribly powerful and convicting. I will take that sermon with me for the rest of my days. I encourage you I strongly encourage you to track down his sermon and listen to it. And in the places where you feel yourself reacting negatively to what he has to say, sit with that for a little while and pray with God about what he might be trying to express to us. I found Francisco's sermon well worth my time, but I also know that in a world that seems to be falling apart all around us, sometimes what we really need is comfort. So hopefully between the two of us, Francisco and I, we provide both powerful, compelling, urging, as well as the comfort that the word can provide. And really, what more could you ask from two Lutheran preachers? Today in our lessons, we hear more stories about call. We hear about the call of Samuel in our first reading, and we hear about the call of Nathaniel in our gospel. Church people love to talk about call. It's our, one of our favorite things. And it's one of our almost code words. When we talk about call in mixed company, not everyone knows what we're talking about. Typically when we use call in the church, it specifically refers to the public ministry overseen by pastors and deacons. They are called to the ministry of word and sacrament. As they go through candidacy, they are asked repeatedly to share their sense of call, provide their call story. But to understand call in such a narrow way really undermines what call actually is. Because each and every one of us as a baptized child of God lives under our baptismal call. And what does it mean to be called through our baptism? It means that we are called to do the work of the people of God. And what is that? Well, we can look at the stories from today to find out a little bit about what that might mean. First of all, being called automatically communicates a sense of vulnerability. Samuel was a child who had been much wished for by his mother, Hannah. 
she would go to the church, to the temple, and she would rock back and forth and she would weep and she would cry and she would pray to the point where the people around her thought that she was drunk. And she would say, I am not drunk. I am just pouring out my heart before God. And she told God, God, if you give me a child, I will dedicate that child back to you. God heard Hannah's prayer. She had a little boy. She named him Samuel. And when he was two years old, she brought him to the priest, Eli, and walked away. Eli becomes Samuel's father figure. And the first task that Samuel is given when he responds to the call of God, yes, Lord, speak for your servant is listening. His very first message is for his beloved father figure to pass along the word that Eli and Eli's sons had found no favor with God and that they would bear the brunt of that for the rest of their days. Now, Eli is not yet a man in this passage. He's still a boy, and he has to come to this person who's been a father to him and condemn him. Do you think he felt a little vulnerable? Do you think he didn't want to have to do it? Being called by God indicates being known on an intimate level unlike anything else. The most intimate of human relationships pale in comparison to the intimacy with which we are known by our God. This is laid out for us in our psalm for today, Psalm 139. You have knit me together in my mother's womb. You know when I lay down. You know when I stand up. Before there is a word on my lips, you know what I am going to say. I am a knitter. If it's rectangular, I'm your gal. If it's a sweater, never mind. What I learned when I was taught how to knit by my grandmother was that when someone is knitting together anything, every single stitch passes through the knitter's hands. Every single stitch, which means everything is there either deliberately, or in sometimes my case, a flaw that I am too lazy to correct. It's not to say that God is too lazy to correct flaws, but I am saying nothing happens without it being known by the knitter. It means that we are known so intimately by our God that there is literally nothing we do that surprises God. There's intense vulnerability in that. Depending upon your current state, there can be an intense amount of shame in that. That God has seen and known every thought, every word, every deed. every good intention, every good intention that was truly undertaken for selfish reasons. God knows just how deep our goodness goes and how shallow it is. God knows when we don't speak out when we should. And God knows when we talk when we ought to keep our mouths shut. Nothing is hidden from God. Nothing about us is hidden from God. There is no corner of your soul that is not intimately familiar with the presence of God in it. You can't pull one over. You might be able to fool a whole bunch of people, but you're not going to fool doesn't mean we won't try, right? Sure, we all try. 
doesn't mean it works. The other thing that being called by God means is that God is no respecter of boundaries. How many times have you been in a position where you needed to cry out for help and you were afraid or ashamed or embarrassed to do so? Our youngest has always been an independent individual to the point where when they were barely even two years old insisted on taking a three and a half mile hike and when several family members because it was an extended family hike offered to help carry them when they got tired would sing back to them i can do it myself so i mean our family has a theme song to our own independence. We can make things better ourselves. We can save ourselves. We have enough power in ourselves. We can believe in ourselves. None of this is true. None of this is accurate. None of this has anything even remotely with, to do with what it means to be called. What it means to be called is to be utterly vulnerable, small, and seen, and not found wanting. That's what we're afraid of, isn't it? That we'll be seen and found to be not enough. But instead we are seen and known and loved. Against all sense and reason. What, what do we do with love like this? Our instinct is to push it away, and yet God, being a re no respecter of boundaries, continues to come over and over and over again, proclaiming love, proclaiming forgiveness, proclaiming accountability, proclaiming our calledness. Go, therefore, and baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy of Spirit, so that they may be known as the children of God. You are called. And there are responsibilities that come along with that. And Pastor Herrera goes into that a little more in depth in his sermon than I do in this one, so I commend it to you. But you are beloved. Every stitch of you, every warp, every weft, every freckle. You are known and you are beloved. And that is ultimately, at its root, what it means to talk about call. To hear your name proclaimed by the creator of the universe. To know that you have been renamed God's child. To know that for all of the things that you have done wrong and all the ways that you have let yourself and others down and for all the ways you need to seek and ask forgiveness and make atonement, that none of that reality is enough to separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. In a world intent on fomenting division. Let us remember that. That even those we disagree with are looked with love by our God. It makes no sense. It never has. But it is true. And it is certain 
and it is well worth building a life upon. Beloved of God, hear your name called. Stand as one of the family of God and be at peace. Amen.